Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Battle Buddy Podcast. You really need to pay attention if you are, especially if you are a newer service member. Uh, if you're serving, you definitely need to pay attention. But new service members, this is your call to wake up and pay attention. Uh, my guest today wrote a book that is designed for service members, but especially for the new boots uh, on personal finances. I know it is a topic that you probably don't really want to talk about, but hey, we're going to dive into some things like the their 36% interest uh, Mustang finance and all those things. So, hey, look, your finances are important. They're su super, super important. So, um, you know, it's, it's something you need to take very seriously. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into it. Welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast with Keith McKeever. Welcome to the show, Conrad. Hey, Keith. Thanks for having me on. Well, no problem. I am super excited to have you on here. Like I said in the intro, like it's it's not the topic I think most new troops probably want to hear about because they're probably used to their chain of command, you know, you know, having commanders calls or whatever, talking about finances. You know, you only make so much money. You got to budget it, and you got to mm -hmm. do this, that, and the other with it. And it, it's not the uh, it's not the most fun topic to talk about, but it's important. And right. we're gonna dive right into it. But before we do, like, share a little bit about your story and and you know, what was your military uh, journey and, and whatnot first? All right. Uh, so I started off in the Marine Corps. Uh, I was uh, uh, a UAV mechanic in a VMU. And what kind of all kicked everything off and got me to where I am today is I went on a, de a deployment. I was lucky enough to deploy kind of in a time where it was kind of transitioning to the peacetime stuff. And I got back and I had to some money saved up because we got you know the tax-free combat zone pay and i got promoted out there and and so i came back all of us you know we had a good amount of good amount of cash saved up from like a seven months deployment and a lot of the guys like right away day one day two they did exactly what you said they got that mustang at that 36 percent interest and it's like a it was cool seeing all these new cars but i was like i don't think that's right i think i need to do something a little bit different so when I was out there, I had a buddy, he had told me to read this book called uh, Rich Dad. And I have this rule where if a Marine tells me to read a book, I read it because, you know, a lot of us, we don't read. <laughs> so, so I was on a duty one night and I, it was like a 24 hour post. And so I got that book and I read it and it really, uh, to my mind and got the little light bulb to switch about kind of caring more about your personal finances and understanding the bigger picture and like, you know, how to um, really get ahead instead of just, you know, buying that car and doing the basic stuff that you, you kind of see is what you should be doing. Um, so ever since then, I kind of, I got into real estate, took a lot of personal finance stuff real seriously, got obsessed with it. Um, and I have a passion for teaching and spreading this knowledge because unfortunately, it's one of those things that if I didn't come across that book, who knows where I would be at nowadays. And I know a lot of people don't ever get that, that knowledge, that experience on their own. Not everyone's lucky enough to have that leader, you know, in the unit who takes it upon themselves to teach you, or it's hard to ask about. It's hard to talk about finances sometimes. So that's why I wrote the book, uh, Boots Guide to uh, Financial Basics, to kind of lay the foundation and give you a like a no nonsense kind of starter, like a primer into finance. Like a lot of the big problem with a lot of these guys is they don't know how to get into it because you don't know some of this stuff exists. So I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit today when it comes to like retirement, like what is a Roth? What's a what is a high yield savings account? What is interest? You know, a lot of guys don't really know what these concepts. So that's kind of what, uh, what started it all for me and how I got here. Yeah. We, I, th I think it's a, it's important to realize that a lot of service members join, you know, 18 to 22. And mm -hmm. if you don't get financial education from home, you're probably not going to get it in the military because your, your frontline supers, supervisors may not have gotten that education either. Your, right. your senior NCOs may not have gotten it. You know, hell, even your officers may not have gotten that either. So you may not have somebody in your unit to turn to who might have the base level of knowledge to give you like good information about this stuff. 
you know, cause it's, it's just like the internet, yeah. like you can turn to some things and, um, it may not really be good information. Um, but there are, there, there is like basics that you should know and that you should follow. And it's, it's, uh, we're, we're both in real estate. So, you know, what's, what is the one thing that you need for, for a building? You need your foundation. Exactly. It's, it's yep. the same thing with finances. It's, 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 you know, understanding the basics of, you know, checking and savings and a budget and things like that. So like you got to understand those basics. And when you're 18 years old and somebody hands you whatever the basic pay rate is right now for, for E1, E2, E3, whatever. Um, I know back in the day for us, it was a lot less, right. but, you know, 700, 800, $900, you know, it's like, Ooh, just some money right there. <laughs> you know, like, Hey, I can, you know, and especially if you got like a, you know, you know, don't shoot the airman at me, but you know, you got a dorm room, you know, you got like no bills, you got nothing. You know, when I served is like, I don't even know. No, I didn't have a cell phone, you know, back then, like no car, no cell phone, no, like no bills. Like there was right. nothing like, like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even have a TV until I got to Japan. Like I had to push a, a guy. I, I had to walk like four blocks to the shop at, and I, borrowed the shopping cart and I got an Xbox like a 360. Yeah. Yeah. It was Xbox 360 and a TV. And I pushed a, the grocery cart all the way down to the dorm, <laughs> carried the stuff up three, you know, two or three flights and then pushed the cart all the way back. You know what I mean? I was like, that's just what you, what you kind of had to do. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> like That was my first big, like that's like all my, you know, now, now we have so much more tech, but anyway, like, right. And it, it's, it's uh... important. Yeah, definitely. And kind of what you said is we, like a lot of us, you know, we all come from different backgrounds when you join the military, especially on the enlisted side, you know, so a lot of guys, myself included, that $800 every two weeks was the most money I've ever seen. And I didn't know really how to handle it. Kind of luckily, I, you know, kind of had the idea that I should kind of start saving and protect this because, you know, it was a lot of money to me, but I know a lot of people, they, they blow it all, you know, and which hand a lot of guys, yeah, it's not a lot of money, but at the same time, you could flush that down the toilet and you'll still live. You know, your food's paid for, you got the barracks, your basic health is taken care of. So, and you know, you you're getting these, paid in two weeks. Right. And so if you learn these principles early on and you know how to properly manage it and have a game plan to get ahead, you can save so much of that and really set yourself up for if you stay in or when you get, get out. Um, I agree. It's absolutely so to, to dive into it. Cause I kind of wanted to yeah, kind of walk through some of the chapters of your book, just kind of touch a little bit on, on some of the chapters. So, okay. One of them, you kind of touch on checking and savings a little bit. So what, what are like two or three different things somebody should know speaking to maybe the, the 18 to 22 year olds that could listen to this, what are two or three things they should know about uh, checking and savings accounts? some of the basics. Okay. I think uh, the main thing to learn, the first one that I really want to talk about is just understanding what the difference between a checking and a savings account is. I know a lot of like your older viewers and a lot of adults, they, they kind of know, I guess what it is, but some people don't figure out, they, they just have all their money in a checking account for their entire time. Uh, pretty much what it is, is a checking account is for everyday expenses you're going to be actively using that money and you need to have access to it, you know, with the credit card, like right then and there, you don't want to go through the process of moving money around to spend it. Um, and your savings account is going to be designed for saving whatever money that say you have enough money saved up for um, your operational day-to-day -day stuff. Anything excess needs to be put somewhere else like a savings account. And the reason why you do that is because generally your savings account, is going to have a higher rate than your checking account. And now like that's something I'm always telling everyone to get into is the high savings account. So for example, my checking account I have right now is like 0.05% or something, um, which is a school when you compare it to the high yield savings account is getting me 5% right now. And I know it seems like a small number if you have a hundred dollars in there, but slowly over time, you will start saving up money. If you follow all these things, all, you know, get a plan together, you will and grand it sitting in your savings account. 
And it, at that amount of money, the difference between 0.05% and 5%, it adds up, you know? And then like that, and you're chasing the higher interest rate, it's going to be no time before you have 50 grand. And then it's even more money now. And it's that whole compounding interest type thing. So I would say just understand what the difference of a checking and a savings is and actually use it in your budgeting plan. So if you know that you're going to spend $600 a month or $500 or whatever it is you yourself to be spending for bills, food, your entertainment, because you, you know, you got you do have to have fun and, you know, not don't be a hermit, but whatever it is Save you allow fun. yourself to Save spend. Save fun. Let's for those Marines. And <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> So you put that in your checking account because you need access to it and anything above that, you know, budget a certain amount, say every like a hundred bucks, $150 is going to go to the savings account and it's going to sit in there. And so savings accounts will usually uh, have that, uh, the limits a lot of times. So like the one I use, you can only pull out of it five times a month, which, which is fine because like I said, you, you put that money specifically to go to be stashed away. Um, and then the checking account, I have my direct debit card to it. And then that's what you spend every day. That's, that's the main one. Um, I'd say number two is uh, when you're actually like looking for a checking account, is to change it if you find that it's not working for you. I think, uh, I'm sure I'm sure it was the same for you. Like you get out of boot camp, and they have a setup for you already at some credit union or some bank that's near us. When I was in, uh, they would send us to like, uh, Pacific Marine or something, which like an atrocious website at the time, it was really bad and it just wasn't modern at all. I think that bank was just kind of living off, you know, the Marines getting out of boot camp and by default getting set up with it. But then you get out and then you hear that, okay, everyone's using Navy Fed. And so it takes some time, it takes some paperwork and you move all your stuff over and you now you have a better app feature and it's a little bit better products, better customer service. And like, don't stop there. You know, if, don't be afraid to try out and keep researching and look for other things. So like right now, the checking account that I use is a little bit more tailored for um, kind of for what I use now for the real estate stuff, you know, a little bit more money is sitting in there and moving in and out on a monthly basis. But like I said, I know a lot of got people who just never, never change it because it's, you have your money sit there and you have all your automatic deductions coming in and out. And there may be a better product out there for you. That will fit what you uh what you need um but other than that really a lot of the other stuff it may sound like common guys don't know that you know the fine print has different fees um in these checking accounts um i would say especially starting out like some of these banks may have like features and products and stuff that sound good but you really probably don't need them and the way that money is they're going to be charging you fees so like uh, uh, account minimums, you probably don't want something that has an account minimum because the day you go under five grand or under three grand, if they charge you 50 bucks, you know, you know, today's day and age, you know, you don't need that free products out there that they just want to hold your money because the bank's just going to invest it anyways. So to me, I think those are the main things to kind of understand is the yield, you know, Make sure don't only kind of keep in your checking what you need. Put the rest in a savings account to get that higher interest. Make sure you have something that is easy to use and fits your needs. Like if you're someone who is cash and checks all the time, you probably don't want a online only bank that doesn't have, you know, e check. So just different things like uh, different things like that. But that will, all that stuff kind of comes in the future, as you know, as you get more of the basics down, I guess. Yeah, I think there's what? some things that you could. Oh, so my thoughts on that: the, the savings account versus like the high yield. If you just put some money into a regular savings account, it's no different than just taking a stack of cash and just putting it on top of your dresser. Um, right. As low as those rates are, you're not making anything on that money just sitting in. The the rates on a savings account or a checking account is so minimal. You're, you're making hardly anything. So literally you could put the money in your dresser and it's, it's not much of a right. difference. So if you know, put, yeah, that's put that money away that. for, for a rainy day and actually make something on it. That's even if you're making five bucks or, you know, making something small, you're making something versus nothing. 
So right. that's, that's definitely a good one. Yeah. What you said too, in case someone does understand kind of what you just mentioned about how it's no better than sitting on a dresser. Uh, what you're talking about is like a inflation. And that's what I'm saying, chase the yield. And you have to understand like what inflation is, is set at. Generally, it's supposed to be around 2% a year. The government will uh, devalue your money by 2%. And that goes into a whole like economic stuff of like growth and all that. But the fact is it happens. So if you don't beat 2% with your money, you are losing money. Essentially, the cost of living is going to outpace what your dollar is. So that's why it's important to understand these things. So that way, as you get over time in those, you know, a 2% losses a lot, if you have anything significant saved up, so you need to chase the yield and put that in something that's 5% or whatever. I don't, I don't like telling people sometimes like, like you need 5% or you need 3% because it does change on the market. It depends on what you get and what the rates are at, at the time. But as long as you're informed and you do your research and you know, like the idea of it, you'll be able to make that decision to always make sure you're getting the most out of you at that you can out of your money that you have. Yeah. I think anything that you want to save up money for long-term, that's going to be a year or two out. That's where you want to mm -hmm. put that money, you know, your, your little nest egg or vacation fund or things like that. If the money's going to come into your account and then back out for utility bills or rent or whatever, like that can go right into your checking account in and out, right. you know, it comes in and goes out in and out the same month. How much interest you make on it doesn't matter because it's straight in, straight out. Um, right. I mean, for for ninety nine percent of us, that's that's how it is on a monthly basis. So, um, but there's, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of good stuff there. Uh, check checkbooks, I think, is a, is another interesting one, especially if you're young. You know, if they're trying to give you some like benefits on a checkbook, it's probably not worth it to you. Look, I, I exactly. work with a lot like of young you don't people need to be who like. For them either. What do you need a checkbook for? Set up everything automatic payment. Then you don't have to worry about missing payments. And if you're not missing payments, then you're not having dings on your credit. Just set them right. up as automatic. If you need a check, then check with the bank that you can call or you can email or you can do something online where they can cut a check and mail it for you. And then it just makes right. it so much easier for you. You don't need a, a, a checkbook. You know, you don't need to be the old guy like me that still writes checks. <laughs> <laughs> in our I do industry, it I <laughs> for some reason they need checks like i always yeah. get mad when they're like i need a check i'm like dude it's 2023 like can i just sell you the money like but they're like nope it needs to be a yeah. check or a certified like dang it okay. i st yeah. i feel like a dinosaur in, in my late 30s here <laughs> but i i still write checks for a couple of things I, I write you know a handful a month but um i think i still like just knowing when the money's going out but that hey that's just me um but yeah like you know for most people, like you just, just set it up automatic and you don't have to worry about it. And, right. and it, it's just easier, you know, then you, especially if you're still serving, it's so much easier to budget because then you set it up, it's done, you know about it. Uh, then it's all in your budget because the last thing you want is to have financial problems when you're serving, uh, because mm -hmm. nobody wants the first sergeant breathing down your neck, uh, because you know, well, well, let's just back that up. They're going to breathe down your senior NCO's neck and then your, then your NCO's neck and then then they're going to be asking, you know, you questions, uh, be, you know, we all know how that goes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I've, I, I've been there as the NCO. Like, why is your troop like in financial? I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, it's like, they don't, they don't tell me what their financial pride anyway. So. Right. And the last thing uh, you want is some Sergeant yelling at you who doesn't know the finances either, but he's telling you to fix your stuff. And you're like, what do I do? <laughs> exactly. Cause it's like, it, you and know, who knows what he'll tell you. Um, I mean, maybe that's a good, good, good point right here to talk to the NCOs that listen. Um, I know it's not an easy conversation to have with your troops, but you should maybe have a conversation every now and then. Hey, are you doing good? Are you managing everything okay? Is there anything that I should be worried about? Maybe mm -hmm. as simple as that. Like, hey, I don't need to know like the breakdown of like you have X amount of dollars going here and X amount of dollars going there, but like, is everything okay? Do you have a, do you have right. a handle on everything? Like everything good. Okay, cool. Like, let me know if there's going to be a problem and there's a, you know, what storm coming down from the top. We all. <laughs> right. A, I think, uh, another thing too, for like some advice for like NCO is kind of, if you just talk about things on your own, they'll kind of see you that, you know, this topic very well. So like for me, I've always been into the finance stuff. And so I'll be talking about it, like just 
chilling out at the smoke pit, I'll be like, oh yeah, I read this cool book book about fee management or real estate investing or something. And then people start saying, oh yeah, like they'll be interested. And then it kind of opened up. Now they're like, all right, this guy kind of actually knows what it is. And then they'll start talking. And then that's when they'll open up more and tell you about, hey, what should I do with this? You know, I have this money saved up or they'll be like, hey, like you know, they'll start talking about the credit card debt or something. Um, because there is kind of sometimes problems with like good intentions, but the bad advice comes out like, you know, I get it. You, like they try to help, but if you don't know, sometimes like just guide them to the sources of what to do. Uh, I feel yeah. like a lot of finance stuff on like, uh, it's kind of like they say like running, like everyone can run. Running is so accessible that every human has ran at one point in their life for the most part. But when, you know, there's a reason why like Olympic runners have coaches to train them how to run and how to do things better, you know, and finances is a similar thing. We all do it because you have to fault, but it doesn't mean you know it, or it doesn't mean you have the best plan or best knowledge. So just with anything, you should always be looking for the next stuff and keep stay on top of it, figure out what changes and evolve to, you know, what it changes to every, you know, it's always changing. Like I think the great market's always changing. You got to keep up with it. So it's kind of Absolutely. a tangent, but <laughs> no, no. You know what? I had another idea while you're, while you're saying that speaking to the NCOs and I, I love talking about the topic of leadership. We all know NCOs are the backbone, right? Yep. Here's an idea. Here is the resource right in front of you. If you are an NCO, start a book club. And I know a great yeah. book that you could start with <laughs> and have these conversations. <laughs> I bet you can't guess what book I'm going to say. It's a boots guide mm -hmm. to financial basics would be a great place to start. Uh, obviously, once you're done with that, I have a whole plethora of books on my on my website. What you know for a bunch of other topics that you could go after next. But you know, I mean, that's that'd be a great opportunity to to just kind of gather around the troops and say, hey, let's start a book club. You know, in our free time, like read a chapter a week, and then you know. After shift, let's go to the VFW or the Legion post. Everybody grab a beer and we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll decompress after a week. Let's talk about, let's break down this. Let's, you know, whatever for, for 45 minutes, half hour, hour, whatever. Or maybe after PT on Friday or whatever, after the end of the shift, what, I don't know, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, and then you're having purposeful conversations and then everybody's right. reading it. And then you're taking action in a, in a, in a group group setting. So there's, there's a nugget right there for you for NCOs to step <laughs> up, lead from the front. Right. Um, but anyway, right. The, the next thing I wanted to get into is the, the, uh, oh, we hit on it already vehicles and 36% interest rates. Everybody's oh, yeah. running joke about troops and poor, dumb, stupid financial decisions. Um, so what, I mean, we've seen it like, my first deployment, um, pre-deployment training, I went to Fort Lewis and I remember as an airman being there, uh, walking around there, you know, of course our deployments were shorter, but these army guys, <laughs> I remember going to their, their chow hall or I know they don't call it a dining facility in the army, but I remember, I mean, they had, you know, Escalades, Mustangs, Camaros, like it was just <laughs> like, it was like, dang, these dudes are deploying like four times longer than us. Look how much money these guys are making. Like, right. <laughs> I mean, it was grind just it out like, for a year and come back with some serious cash. <laughs> ooh, I can't imagine the insurance rates on some of those cars, but you know, it was like, it was ridiculous. The amount of uh, money sitting in that parking lot. But you know, the, the truth is like there, there are car dealerships that will give you, if you have like no credit because you're 18 or 19 years old, <clears throat> no credit, no problem. Come on in. We'll, we'll, right. We'll, we'll sell you a car. I'll take on, They'll, 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 and they'll do it, you know, and it's like, it's crazy. Like it's a running joke that these, these loans get signed and stuff. You know, everyone knows the joke, like that 26, 36% rate on a Mustang, but it happens. And we all know guys who get it. So it's being, is like the first step one, know that, yeah, you need to watch out and you need to understand these kind of things because you need to understand the concept of like kind of like shopping around and don't go to the first person you see even now, like, you know, 
even if you have like good credit and you know what you're doing, like shop around, you know, call around everyone else is uh, offering, call other lenders and research the process and know what you're getting into. Um, I think a big thing, what you just said is uh, one, one of the things I wanted to talk about on this topic is the insurance and understanding the total cost of ownership to some of these cars. A lot of, you know, they get straight out of boot camp and they probably have like, you know, a couple grand saved up or they come back from a deployment and they got a lot of money and can't afford that car on paper technically, you know, and that's why the dealer gave it to them. But the problem is, is a lot of guys don't know that, like, for example, like I know guys, I'll go get like a BMW. It's cool. It's used and it's in their budget and it's fine, but it's got like 40,000, 50,000 miles on it. And to, like that prime time getting some major maintenance things uh, taken care of on it. And they don't know that you're, unless you know how to do the work yourself on some of those cars. And if you have to take it somewhere, you're going to pay a premium because it's a luxury car or an import. Um, and then even if you do know how to do the work yourself, those parts itself cost more than if you were to get like your standard, like economy car, um, there's less of them and the people who buy them have more money. So they know that they can charge more for brakes. They can charge more for, uh, you know, the radiator. Like I had a friend one time, his radiator blew up in his uh, BMW and I forget how much it was, but it was like a couple grand. And I had like an old 1990s beater Fox body Mustang. And I had to replace my radiator at 1.2 and it was like $150. And I was like, holy crap, you know, like that's a huge price. And if you don't think about that stuff before you tie yourself up into a car like that, um, it can surprise you and it can really mess up your finances in the long run. If you're, you know, taking such a huge amount of your wealth away from yourself at such a younger age, that, and then the insurance on a lot of these things, you know, we, I, I get it, you know, sport, Sports cars are cool, but if you're going to go get like a two-year-old or brand new Challenger, a two-door car, like the interest for that, especially at the age that most of these guys are. If you're like 18, 19, 20, you're going to pay an arm and a leg for that insurance. So you have to factor that into it as well. Um, but yeah, it's crazy. Like, uh, I, I don't know, it's hard to explain some of these things to like younger people because I get it. I was there. You want to look cool and you want to have the... the nice car and every, I think there was a quote in the book I wrote about how, like, you know, you get out, you're this invincible warrior and you're the, you could just accomplish something crazy in your life. And you think, you know, you, you want the car to match what you think you are now, but you got to fight it. You know, it sometimes drive that beat up old Camry or something because you're that way you can save and invest that money in the future and really get ahead. So that's that's one big thing. Yeah, that I think it's, is a uh, pretty important. It's not easy to. Uh, it's not easy to make some of those decisions. <laughs> I had yeah. uh, let's see, what did I drive when I was in? When I came back from Japan, I actually found at a, a local bank had a Chrysler 300 that had been repoed. Got a smoking mm. deal on it. I didn't even like Chrysler 300s, but <clears throat> I ended up keeping <laughs> that one around for years. Um, so I had that for a while. I had a Silverado 1500, like a 98 Silverado, but then I met my wife and she got pregnant and car seats don't fit in the back of an extended cab Silverado there. Well, the, the late nineties versions, right? Uh, she had a little Toyota echo. So we ended up selling it and, uh, I ended up buying a Dodge Ram and this thing was sweet. 2009 Dodge Ram custom build out of florida they had it shipped up to illinois this thing had it it was every every single bell whistle that you could possibly have made on it it was it was something else but it got like uh -huh. 11 miles per gallon you know oh and, yeah and, you know, 20 <laughs> 25 years old <clears throat> like even though my insurance rates went down turning 25 and getting married shortly after right like i was still punching it you know, I, matter of fact, the way I drove it, I think the, the, the fuel economy said 12 miles per gallon. I think I was probably getting nine. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this is like 2010, 2011. Like, I mean, I was just eating through gas, you know, and that was a tough decision for me. Like when I got out, it was like, this isn't sustainable. I don't know what I'm going to do when I get out of the military. Like, you know, a few months before I got out and it was, so I had to, I had to get rid of it. 
and I took a loss, you know, went upside down, mm. ended up, uh, my wife and I ended up with, uh, uh, which I think was, a, ended up being a good decision. We ended up with a Volkswagen Jetta turbo diesel, which I absolutely loved. I actually ended up liking that more than I liked the truck, which is kind yeah, of crazy. That, I, oh, it was a sweet little nice. car. Yes, yeah. it was, it was awesome. Had it for years. Um, but you know, it's, it, it, you know, I mean, the truck was pretty sweet, you know, the heated seats and all the bells and whistles. And then you go down to a, the Jetta turbo diesel and it's just not as cool. And you miss it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's, you know, but then I drove it for years, you know, and I was so the fuel economy and it was just so fun to, it was actually fun to drive. But anyway, you know, I mean, it, it, you swallow a little bit of pride. It's like, yeah, it's, it's not as cool, you know, to, to right. go down to There's something a, that's like, more of a family sedan ish kind of thing from a, from a cool truck or, or a sports car or something like that. So, right. There's a, an idea that I kind of like to, always repeat to people because as someone told to me and it really stuck with me there's like a common thing with a lot of people is they say oh you're, you're young you know your abilities go have fun do everything you want you know live live this nice life and stuff you know because you know if you don't have money no one cares but the way i take that is opposite you if you have no money no one cares because you're so young it's expected right so save all that money live poor live poor but like live frugally you know because no one cares really. Like if no one's really judging you, if you're 23 years old, 19 years old in that age bracket, if you're driving, you know, or if you don't have, if you're not uh, portraying that you have money, if that makes sense. So what I like to do is tell people that, look, you're young, no one cares. Save all that, save it, save it, save it. Live frugally, drive the beater. Don't blow your money on like crazy expensive things, save it. And, learn what to do with it and invest it. So that way, when you're in your thirties and your forties, now you've gotten ahead, you know, now when people look at you and see the things you can now come forward and responsibly afford, it looks normal now because that's what we expect out of, you know, older adults. So if you sacrifice it when you're young, you'll be set up more when you're 30 or 40, 50 and so on. And then that's when people start to kind of, that's when the judging matters more, you know, it's like, I hate to say it, but like, like I know, like a lot of people, it's like, you know, you're 40 and you don't have your place or like, you don't, you're like, you don't have a car or your car's like a complete beater. You can't reliably get it from work, like to work and stuff. That's when people start judging and that's what you don't want to end up as you. So you want to make those sacrifices now when you're young. Um, and there's such a perfect opportunity to do it because you're guaranteed that paycheck every two weeks. And a lot of your things pretty much paid for, you know? So it's the best time to just pocket that, you know, bum rides with friends, get a beater and just, you know, live that lifestyle. That'll be yeah. frugal, you know, instead of buying that, uh, you know, that two year old Mustang, you know, at 15, 30% interest, go buy that, you know, five or six year, 10, 10 year old Chevy Impala. That's, you know, bright white or, tan color that's not you know the most attractive color that's a family sedan that gets decent gas mileage that you know look it's got four wheels it runs it's clean yep it's got a radio that works it gets you from point a to point b yeah like who cares what anyone thinks about it and as long as you get there and you're saving you're making the right you're, you're making the right financial choice by doing something like that and you know, use a lot of guys in units who know how to work on cars and stuff, like use them, like make friends and say like, Hey, you know, that's what I used to do all the time. You know, I had this old, like, I love like Fox body Mustangs and like muscle cars, but I still like, you know, went crazy cheap. It was like a, it's like $5,000 and me and my friends, we kept it running. You know, that was how, what we did for fun. Like on the weekends, we'd go to the shop and just work on it and keep it running and, you know barely spent anything on it because parts were so cheap. You'll get them from the junkyard and everything. And I get that's not for buddy, but the point is, is think about the long-term financial consequences of getting these like real high dollar, like basically you shouldn't be maxing out your budget to get a car. You should always keep things in relative to what you can still have enough to save and invest and get, get ahead. Well, same thing. I mean, I wasn't really going to talk about it, but we're, we're both in real estate. So same thing with the house too. Um, I mean, I've seen it many times where people, 
not just those that are st- they're start still serving, but you know, veterans or or non veterans, like they get into a house and they make X amount of money, and then they become, for lack of a better term, house poor, and they mm-hmm. are spending every available dime on their house payment, private mortgage insurance, insurance, you know, taxes, all that stuff, all that stuff combined, all those extra fees or maintenance and and repairs. I've gone into a lot of houses where it was very clear. Somebody bought the house with intentions to fix it up and they clearly ran out of money and couldn't afford it and then sold it mid repair. And so like, don't get yourself in that position. Yeah. I mean, that's why it's important to have a budget. I mean, it's, that's, that's, that's huge. So with that, um, what should somebody do when it, speaking of budgets, what should somebody do when it comes to a budget? What should that look like, especially for, for military members, since they kind of have such a fixed, I mean, you know how much you're making, you know, your healthcare right. and all that stuff is taken care of. It's far easier to budget than us when, when we're self-employed and, and we're not you knowing exactly what we're going to get every, every month. Right. Uh, for, I don't want to say as do a specific thing because kind of what I like my whole outlook with the book was laying foundations. So that way, you know, and you go find the rest of the knowledge and find what works for you. Like real estate, for example, I know it's not for everybody. Stocks and bonds are not for everybody. You know, running a business isn't for everybody, but basics of it. So that way you can develop your own plan. And it's the same with the budgeting for me. Uh, I know like what I do is not going to be mentally sustainable. I was like, super like frugal and like i still kind of am and so so, like what i did myself like i'm gonna leave like 300 dollars out of my uh account or like this month i'm gonna do 200 dollars, and that's what i would put in my checking account and the rest goes away then so i really wasn't like for me at least i wasn't like breaking it down saying this how much this is how much is going to go to the savings this is how much much is going to go to my Robin hood account for like stocks. This is going to go to my retirement or this is going to do this. I kind of said, I'm only going to spend $150 this month or $200 or whatever it is. I kind of made it like a game. And it is to me, that was mentally sustainable. I feel like you have to find something that you're willing to stick to and accomplish because if, if it's miserable for you, if you're like, if for what, whatever reason that thing of telling yourself, I'm only going to spend this much on this is like not fun for you, or you think it's miserable. You're not going to stick with it. It defeats the purpose. So I know some guys, what they do is um, they have it like almost like a, like a pie chart. They will have this percent is going to go to this, this thing, this person, this thing, and X, like so on. And so that as they like their pay increases, the percents, you know, stay the same Some guys, they do more of like a dollar amount type thing. They say like, every month, a hundred dollars will go to this, or, you know, if their budget for a car is like $300 a month, month, that's how they judge what they can afford for their cars. You know, they're going to keep it within that dollar amount. Um, so that's the big thing is just finding a plan that you can stick to and know what you're going to be putting your money to. Like, like we were talking about at the beginning with the chase, in the interest rate so that you have most of your money sitting into something that is, uh, I don't want to say like valuable, but being a productive use of that money, you, you know, don't like, you shouldn't be like, you should, like 50% of your money shouldn't be being spent on like stuff. If you know, I'd say you should be trying to save if you can save over half of your money. So even if you're at the bottom, like of the pay scale, making $800 every two weeks, if you can, stash away that 800 you're probably doing good and then if you can just make it a game to where okay let's try let's try to stash away 900 this month and see how that feels all right let's do a thousand this month let's see how that feels just and figure out what works for you and just stick to it and if it's not cut it back figure out a way that works and over the long run if you do that if you keep changing plans like or like if you keep chasing it that those ideas for three years, but at the end you were still stashing away money. Like you'll, it'll work out fine. You know, yeah, makes sense. I, I like the idea too of, uh, you know, what's, what's sustainable. What can you, you know, what can you do long-term? Cause if, if you lose focus on it and you just stop doing it, then it's, you know, it's recipe for disaster. And, uh, um, right. I never really thought about the pie chart thing. I'm the kind of person that would have to like, 
I got to look at the numbers. I got to be like, all right, this is this X amount of dollars and cents for house payment. This is, this is how much I'm going to spend, you know, but then whatever you got left over, then you, then you got to look and be like, Oh, what do we put in savings? What do we put in for entertainment? What do we do, you know, for, for over here and over here and over here. So yeah, that's, that's some good advice there. Yeah. All of our, uh, brains work a little different. as long as we kind of accomplish the same thing that's what that's what matters the most so if you're like a real like to the t numbers guy and you're like we're only spending 60 bucks in insurance this month or you know so something like that that's great but i can't think like that so i just give myself a cut a hard number to spend for like the fun stuff and that's it so if i'm going to the movies you know that that amount of money and then i go buy fast food okay that's 20 more dollars off of that month like they got it broken down pretty good and it works for them. So yeah, teach his own as long as it works. Right. So, yep. I know a couple other things I wanted to, to, to dive into next was credit cards, which I love this topic. Oh uh, yes. <laughs> credit and credit cards. Um, especially when it comes to the military and the star card, I, I'm, I'm assuming they still have the star card. I don't know why they would ever get rid of that. I'm sure that's still advantageous yeah. for, for the exchanges, but what should kind of a two part question, what should troops look out for when it comes to credit cards and how could they best utilize credit cards to their advantage? So this is kind of a longer topic and you can go at it so many different ways. This is why I love it because it's it is more complex than I think a lot of people think about. First, you have to understand, like, and it doesn't matter if you think it's dumb or if you like no, un, like. The fact is, we live with it, and you have to play by the rules, and you have to do it. You know, because if, if you want to get ahead in line, a decent credit score, or else it's going to be that much harder to do anything. Credits like just so integral to like that you have to really protect it and you have to build it so with like real estate for example most people at some point will buy a house or get into a house even if you're renting they're going to run your credit most so it matters so much because it goes back to the understanding the interest rate and knowing how it works so if you have bad credit and you apply for a house and Someone else with good credit applies for the exact same house. If that guy is getting a 4% rate and you're getting a 6 or 7% rate over a 30 year period that you would be paying to the bank just because you have bad credit, it, it's, it's crazy. And like, you know, whether you agree with the system or not, it, it does, it, that's just how it is. And you have to play the game. And so once you kind of understand what the credit scores are used for, why it's important, you know, because they're going to deal with your credit score. Now, once you understand it and understand the importance, now you can say, okay, what are the ways that I can build my credit to have a good, good score? And one of the easiest ways, in my opinion, is through credit cards because credit cards are loans from the bank. They're basically like pre-approved loans. At any so if you get a credit card and you have your, say a $10,000 limit on it, that means the bank is entrusting you to go away for 10 grand and you're going to pay it back and they don't have to worry about it. So because those are riskier loans, because, you know, there's a chance that you don't pay it and you just, you know, do out and take, they charge a high interest rate on it. Usually these, you know, it's like in the 20% range is yeah. So what that means is in a year, say you let that money just sit for a year, you will have paid 26% of that balance on top of, of what you spent. So if you spend a hundred dollars on something, you're going to pay $120, $126, somewhere around that total for that same product. And so little, little numbers, it seems like it's, but you know, if, if you max that $10,000 credit card out, now you're talking about $2,600 and yeah, it's, that's, that's a lot of money. That can be it's, very difficult for people to recover from. If yeah, you're talking, it can be. you know, if you max out one credit card at 10,000 and you have another one at five and you have another one at seven you know what i mean and you have high balances and you're struggling to make those payments that's where a lot of people you know get in get into trouble that's this that's the uh trap that they put you into and they know it like you know that's the oh, yeah. idea that's why they're always giving you promotions and like 
uh, spend X amount of dollars to get the points and, um, you know, 0% interest for a whole year is because they know no matter what plan you have, have, you know, I always tell people like you, you, if you, you have to use it smartly because I get it. Like I, I'll, I'll use those like programs too, sometimes to help build my credit and get something out of it. And while doing be aware of the game plan that they're coming at you for. So the idea is you spend all, all this money to get that 0% interest. You start making payments on it. And then what do you know, you know, month 11 comes by and your tires popped. Now you got to go buy a tires. And now you're stuck paying that interest on that card because you don't have enough now set aside. So I guess the reason why I like kind of even said all that in the first place is understanding like the dangers of it and need to credit in the first place and why you have to take on those things. Like you have to be careful with them. That doesn't mean they're bad though. And that's the big thing that I try to talk about in my book is that they're a tool if you're responsible and you know how to use it and manage it. Because what they do is they establish credit hit, and that's a, a huge thing. A lot of people will go get loans for the first time and or they're like get charged like an insane amount of interest rate because they have no credit history. I'm sure, you know, we're both in real estate. We get a home, you know, they're ready to just move into a home, you know, nothing risky, nothing crazy. But then they find out that, you know, they have no credit history or their credit is bad and then they have to pay for it. So are a great way when you're young. I tell everybody, like my brother, uh, he's turning 18 now. 18. And we went through the process. We opened him up a secured credit card. So that way he has that credit history on his account. So that way when he's 22, you know, taking out a loan for money for home or something, he has something to go off of. Um, but yeah. That's what I, that I guess that's the importance of it at first is yeah. taking care of your credit score. There's um yeah, there's a lot of advantages if you use it correctly, but it is it is a dangerous, dangerous uh ball game. Um really I've seen, uh, like I've I seen a lot of people get into a lot of a lot of problems. You gotta be you gotta be really careful. Um so, some of the it can really affect your credit. Um, yeah, I'm, tr I'm trying not to go too far, too far down the rabbit hole because I, I know I could go uh, pretty far down there too. I know you probably could too, but like, I don't, don't want to get over like we're scaring anybody. Yeah, like, don't because... don't use if you have a ten thousand dollar credit limit, don't use all ten thousand of it. Make a purchase. Here, here's the, the the easiest thing you can do to use this and maximize it. I'll, I'll get your get your thoughts on this. Use it to mm -hmm. buy your gas. Same money that you have in your bank account that you would swipe your debit card for. And there's a, there's a second reason for this. But use your credit card to buy your gas. And then when that bill comes in, use that checking account to pay off the credit card. That credit card also has extra protections for fraud in case there's a skimmer device or something like that on the credit card. Because that happens on the gas pumps. I'm sure you've seen those scam mm -hmm. things out there. So, so you're not potentially putting your debit card at risk in the gas pumps, put the credit card in there and pay it off or do that or buy groceries, little, little purchases and things like that. Um, I think where people get in trouble is where they go, like put a big purchase. Yep. And sometimes you have to, but like, you know, you got to go buy a new washer and a dryer or a fridge. And then now you're putting 2,500 on a credit card and you don't have the money and it's like, okay, well, and then you're looking at your spouse and you're like, all right, well, we're going to put 250 towards it this week or this month. And then you put 250 towards it next month. But then like the third month, you know, maybe your finances aren't good and you can only put 50 bucks towards it and then 50 bucks the next month. And then, you know what I mean? Then you start getting behind and the interest starts racking up. And then all of a sudden the next thing you know, three years later, you're still paying on it. Yep. And that's so where it gets wanna, dangerous. So there's, right. And that's why, like, it's just important. That's why I want to start it off with talking about, you know, the, the negative of it, but I don't want to scare people into not, not getting one easy tool to use for building your credit. So one of the first things I want to say about is you don't have to use the credit card to get the credit score built up. Just by having and maintained is what it's going to do the work for it. Uh, because the time you're a, uh, 
uh, credit age, your average is one of the metrics that uh, they use for the credit score um, calculation. So if you start it when you're 18, when you're 19, you have one age um, and then so on, you know, it keeps going. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is what you said. There is a lot of benefits to using a credit card because at the end of the day, it's the bank's money until you pay it. So if there is fraud or if there's any kind of um, issues or like there's a lot of consumer protection things i've used it so many times like one time i was traveling um and me and my friends we went to a bar in another country and we lost our credit card i lost both of them i guess they both get and i got them back by the end of the night and they were both maxed out and they they maxed out for a good amount of money and i didn't even think anything about it i was like all right when i get back to the states i'll call um you know i'll call the american express people and they, they handled it and nothing. I didn't pay, pay anything. They transaction and they went after it and they just, it went off my account. If that was a debit card, that money would have been gone. Bad. Yep. So bye-bye gone forever. Yeah. Not getting it back. Right. I've had a uh, packages stolen off my porch and I called uh, the credit card company and they say, okay. And it's part of it's in the fine print of their consumer for protection stuff at it, that's covered and it's like an insurance policy and they gave me the money back and refunded it um so we'll, we'll get into that section after like talking about uh picking a credit card for you and what like you know finding something that fits you because every card company does theirs a little bit different they have different benefits um but so yeah that is a benefit of it uh, yeah there's a lot of different things that are out there and you like you got to yeah, there's different rates, there's benefits, there's like travel things, and then there's like cash back. And so, mm -hmm. you know, right. What, what, what kind of, what kind of things are out there? And um, since, since we're on the, on the topic there, just go right into that, then some of those benefits um, and stuff. Yeah. So the consumer protections is a big thing. So there's a lot of like travel cards that um, kind of give you special insurance for traveling. Uh, like it'll specifically say in the fine print um, when you're getting a rental car don't pay the don't agree to their insurance because we have insurance and we're, you, you get it by just putting the purchase on the card. Um, they have a like travel delay insurance. So if you're in the airport 24 hours, um, they have like a certain dollar amount that they'll just give you like 500 bucks or something like that to go spend on food and hotel or something. Um, I've seen some that are um, different purchase per don't uh, accept a return in say if you buy a TV and you're like, you know what? I don't want this. And you try to go return it to Best Buy or something. And they say, no, it's been like 30 days. Um, sometimes the card will say you have 60 days. So if they don't return it, that's fine. Just give us a call. And I've heard that they'll say like, send it to them. I've never seen that. A lot of times they just say, keep it, you know, um, if it breaks within a certain amount of time, they'll usually cover it and give you the money back. Um, like you said, cash back, cash, your number one thing that mo I think anyone who's starting off uh, should go for just a simple cash back card with no, um, because that's, it's just easy to get that. A lot of this stuff, it's like almost like extreme couponing. Like if you're into it, you kind of, you're like using these things and I, I, I'm into that. Like I, I, like I said, frugal. So like if American Express is telling me they're going to give me like $200 by going with this brand versus this brand a way to get that brand but the important thing is is don't ever spend money that you're not you can't afford or you're not intending to spend so you can use all these things as a benefit but but th that's it's part of the marketing you got to understand it's marketing and that's why they're doing it they're trying to entice you to be like insurance on a rental car because then you're like oh okay i'll get a rental car and like when you maybe that wasn't even part of your plan or they'll be like hey you know here's just, um, I don't know, an Apple watch or something. It's like, okay, I guess I'll get an Apple watch. Like you, make sure you're planning to buy this in the first place before you do it. And then make sure you have the money in the savings account to cover it. Because the way it works is you have usually like a 30 day window for the statement balance to close. If you pay off the card before that date closes, you don't pay interest on it. So I have like almost like 10 credit cards now. And I've never once ever any of them. And the reason is because I've paid, I, I treat it like a debit card in a way. So every 
single day my my credit card if i can like some of the real estate stuff you have to use cash and uh checks and debit card but if i can use a credit card i use it and it's part of the you know it's all a big because if you don't budget you can't do this you know if you don't understand the interest you won't understand why not to take the interest charge on so you have to know all these basics and then i use the the credit card every day to you know keep track of everything it keeps track of my spending and all that but the important thing end of the month i click pay it and i pay it all off um i get it emergencies happen and that was another one of the benefits that for credit cards that it, uh, it can provide for emergencies like i've had a uh, family members who they um their ac blew up it blew up and like free on went everyone in their house and they needed the money to replace the ac unit but it was going to be like fourteen thousand dollars and luckily, so luckily when I left, so I had pretty decent credit. And so one of my credit cards, they did, it is like, it's like a twenty thirty thousand $30,000 credit. I'm not saying that to like flex or anything, but I'm saying that as like, that's one of the reasons why a lot of this stuff is important because if you build up your credit, you will have access to, you know, an amount like that. And it's now, so it was me saying, Hey, my AC unit broke, blew up. And it's fourteen thousand dollars, but we don't have the money to cover it. I'm like, okay, and then they had the money, but it was tied up in like other things that weren't liquid. So they needed like a thirty day window to get the money. So that's one of those things where like having good credit kept us from taking out some crazy loan on their end, or like having to like get into real trouble, you know, where it's the middle of summer and you don't have AC. Put it on because you have the credit limit. And then it within like, you know, it took them two weeks and they gave me the money back and I paid it off and never paid any interest on it. But if I didn't have, you know, if I didn't do all those things in the past parts of my life where I built up the credit to where I could get to that point, uh, um, even been an option, you know? Um, so that's why I'm passionate about teaching about these things. Just so that way more people can have these options in their life, you know, so that way they're not stuck do kind of what you're saying with um say you have to buy a washer and dryer with um your credit card like you can do to like get the money but then like if you have decent credit you can go to like credit unions and say hey i need a personal loan and then they'll give you the you know you can say that they'll say how much you need two thousand dollars and they'll be like okay here's two thousand dollars at eight percent interest that's way better than 26 percent interest on that credit card but now if you just have you know really bad credit give you it because they're gonna be like because they still see that debt because in their mind they don't know that you're gonna go pay it off in their mind they're like now you're in debt you know so it's just always having options and understanding these things and like i said chasing the yield make sure you, what did we talk what was that word you used when we last talked about the economic stuff um uh, opportunity cost right yeah. and it's always just thinking like what's the highest and best use of my money at this time and or my debt you know how can i structure my debt in the time because you know like i said we all need it so you can have good debt or you can have bad debt and if you have some bad debt how can you make it a little bit better sometimes and if you have good credit it opens a lot for for that for situations like that absolutely absolutely yeah wow i guess uh man some that's some great nuggets of stuff um great foundation uh, to borrow from part of our conversation earlier um, for, for some of those troops out there, but seriously, like if, you know, if you're a young troop, you just got into military, like you need to pay attention to stuff, man. I, I hate to sound like, like we're the old guys here in a room, like preaching to you, but like we are <laughs> like, we've seen it. We've, you know, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure we both made, questionable financial decisions at one point in oh, time definitely. in our lives. We've seen other troops do it. We've, we've both seen, I've even told stories about seeing other people driving the, you know, the fancy cars that they paid way too much for. Like, don't yeah. make those decisions, right? Like you're going to get out of, out of the, uh, you're going to take that uniform off someday. You're going to go about the rest of your life. What you do when you're young is going to set up the rest of your life. you you, your family, everything. So like, take it serious. Seriously, get this book. Read it, give yourself the foundation, give yourself the basic education, and then you can take it from there. Like if you want to learn more, learn more. If not, 
you know, this is the basic foundation that you can take to at least give you the, the, the information to, to make educated decisions going forward. So, if, you know, if you want to take it from there and dive into the world of stocks and bonds and money markets and, 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 and make your head literally just, you know, spin around like, like, <laughs> like crazy, or if you want to dive into the world of real estate and investing and stuff like that, like there's, there's obviously the world of finance, like it, it can, well, you can go down a rabbit hole, right? Conrad. <laughs> oh yeah. And if a lot of <laughs> this a million sounds different like, directions. yeah, if a lot of this sounds like shockness, like, you know, it, it's kind of, it's kind of hard for me to, present some of these topics verbally and just like, like keep it in a, we don't know any of this stuff. And it sounds like, you know, it's just so much, uh, check out the book. The book was when it's written down, it kind of walks you through a, a little bit more of a, a simple building block type mindset instead of jumping from like credit cards to interest rate. And like, you know, all these top topics are coming at you. This is, but definitely the book is a good place to start. And if you read that, or if you don't want to, like definitely reach out and there's, there's a lot of other good books out there too, and other resources that you can follow and just getting into it and learning that this stuff exists is the first part, you know, to even know about some of these things. They like, they don't even know what a high yield savings account is. So, but yeah, absolutely. You know, that's a good, good point. I mean, I, I picked out these questions because I felt like they were some of the most important, but I, I, I don't know how many chapters you even have in the book off the top of my head, but you know, as I was looking through it and kind of planning for this episode, I was like, no, let's talk about those. Cause those are the bet, you know, budget checking and savings cars, credit, those kind of things is like, you know, but, but you do, you, you know, you go not super in depth, but you go into many other little facets, you know, of the foundation. So like, you know, there's, there's a lot more to it. So it is a good, good place to start. So I do appreciate you sharing a book with me and, uh, and, and coming on here to highlight it and, uh, and, and telling us about it. So I, I do appreciate you coming on and sharing with us. Yeah. I appreciate you having me on. It was a good time. I love talking about this yep. stuff. Uh, I will want to plug my Instagram through here because that's an easy way to direct. Absolutely. Contact me. Yeah. Share it with us uh, any, any other way that anybody can reach out to you. Yeah, the best best way is on at uh, Countin Crayolas. So Countin C O U N T I N underscore Crayolas C R A Y O L A S. I am a Marine, so uh, crowns are my favorite. <laughs> but uh, yeah, send a message on there if you have any kind of questions. I can recommend books that I've read, and I post content on there to kind of help with financial literacy. A lot of these topics in the book time to write in there i talk about so awesome yeah i will yeah. also have your your link in there i will also have the link in the description for the uh the book on amazon it's, i've had it scrolling across the bottom so anybody who's watching will see it there so i appreciate you coming on conrad do you take it easy awesome thank you yep. you too all right there you have it, folks hope you enjoyed that uh seriously you need to go out and get a copy of that book uh, remember, you can check out our website for all kinds of information and resources. If, remember, if something's not there and you think it should, reach out and let me know. And if you are struggling for any reason, remember the National Suicide Hotline number is 988-PRESS-1.